God determines our times and seasons. Good timing is everything. When you bake something, you know, the wattage of the oven, the temperature, whether it's fan-forced or not, all of these things matter. But what also matters is the timing. If you leave it in for too long, it will chao da. If you take it out too quickly, it will be undercooked. Now, similarly, when you go to fancy, fancy restaurants, they'll ask you, how do you like your steaks done? Blue, rare, medium rare, medium, medium well, well done. And you order your steak, and don't you get upset when your steak comes out not the way that you desire it to be? And often this is the same in all other areas of life. We discussed investments last week. You know, we think that timing is important. We think that by putting money into various multi-assets like cash, equities, and bonds, you know, this will uh, have the best yield. We think that we put it in at the right time because if you put it in at the wrong time, you may experience loss. But even when you put it in at the right time, but you don't sell at the right time, you're going to lose out. It's the same with illness. We think that if we catch an illness early, uh, that our health may be preserved, but that illness may be a terrible illness from which there is you know, no cure. And what is frustrating oftentimes is that when we go for our annual health checks, we find that there is nothing wrong. So we did everything early. We went at the right time. But all of a sudden, you discover you have a pain, and cancer developed in the last three months, and it is fourth stage. So it was just the right bad timing. So right timing in doing things doesn't always guarantee the right results. In the same way farmers, they may you know, plant at the right time during planting season, but because there's a cold snap later on, nothing grows. There's no harvest. You have the right timing, but you have bad results because of a bad timing of something you were not responsible for and had no control over. In the same way, a couple may plan and they may conceive a child, expecting nine months later they will have a baby, but during the eighth month, war breaks out. And so right timing is no guarantee, and this is something that we Christians should be very aware of. It is God that determines the seasons, the right times, and we get frustrated often because things don't go our way at the right time. And if you are like me, we like problems solved immediately. You know, uh, we think of something, must do it now. Fixate it, and if it doesn't turn out right, you get frustrated. You know, other people are procrastinators. Ah, there's time. But when it doesn't happen, they too get frustrated. So Ecclesiastes 3 teaches us that despite bad timing, despite things not coming to pass in a timely manner, yet we can still find joy in life's disappointments because we can find joy in God. So we learn, firstly, that God has determined the times and seasons, good and bad. Secondly, these times and seasons are given to burden us. And thirdly, we can find joy in burdensome times. So firstly, God is the one that has determined times and seasons, good and bad, right? So God has a purpose. In verse 1, we learn, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. Now, the word time and the word season, they roughly mean the same thing. They're not speaking about the length of time, but they're talking about specific points in time. You know, seasons of life, uh, events, milestones in life, and there are times in life when certain things and various things happen, and those times have a purpose. So whatever happens in your life, you look at your life, you look at your photo album, going backwards, you think about the future, what you're planning, right? There is a purpose for every of these life events. Now, before Jesus went to heaven, he told his disciples in Acts 1, verse 7, it is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. So these times and seasons of your life, 
they have been ordained by God. It is not for you to have control over them because you cannot. You may plan certain things, but things don't happen often the way you plan to. I mean, how many of us here would love to retire at the age of 60 or 62? We take out our CPF. Wow, somehow 10% growth over 30 years. Wow, I can enjoy my retirement. COVID will be over. I can go and travel right, to all of these exotic destinations. You know, my investment plans, my insurance, everything has been done. My kids have an education. By the way, this is not my dream, okay? All right, but how many of us think that way and suddenly another SARS, another COVID, another thing happens? We cannot control because it is not for us to know, to control the times or seasons. Because these times, these moments of your life, they have been ordained by a sovereign God. Man doesn't know. God did not consult man when he decided he is sovereign. So whatever happens in your life, however, we have to realize these are not accidents. These are not things that we can control. God is the one who has ordained them. You know, Article 13 of the Belgic Confession says, we believe that this good God, after he had created all things, did not abandon them or give them up to fortune or chance, but that according to his holy will, he so rules and governs them that in this world nothing happens without his direction. So even all the times and seasons of our life, they have a purpose, they are not accidental. And there are many different kinds of times and seasons in our lives. And Solomon here lists down different times and seasons. He groups them into seven sets of life events. And these are common events that all of us experience. So what are these events? Verse 2 talks about the length of life, how long we will live. It says a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up that which is planted. So it speaks about an appointed time when we are born and an appointed time that we will die. So only God knows when they will occur. Generally, we do not know. And this is also the same in the plant world. You know, plants will be planted and they will be uprooted in due season. So we are born into this world and as quickly as we are born, 70, 80 years, maybe a month, maybe 100 years, but as soon as we're born, there will be a time that we quickly go to the grave. You know, statistics show that every eight seconds, a person dies, and every three seconds, someone is born. You know, this shortness of life was capitalized on by uh, Nike. You know, for those of us who are old enough, we remember commercials of the past where a child is quickly born in the hospital room and somehow flies across the world. As he flies, he grows older and older, and all the way he becomes old man and straight into his grave. And the slogan for Nike is, life is short, play hard, all right? So everyone recognizes there's a time to be born, a time to die. Secondly, we see here that this life season speaks about times of progress and times of loss. Verse 3, you have a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, a time to build up. So in our life cycle, there are times, especially in agrarian cultures, agriculture, you know, uh, you know, societies, they have to kill animals. They raise them up, they kill them for food. There are times when they have to nurse these animals back to health. You know, you're wondering to yourself, my horse is lame, shall I put it down or shall I, you know, uh, try and heal it so that it can, you know, push my cart again? So there are times also in those societies where you build barns, you have to tear them down. So this refers to our times of work, our investments, our plans. There will be times when you can invest, there are times when your investment plummets, there are times when you need to work, and there are times when you need to leave that job, right? There's no sense of hanging on, or there is a sense to hang on. Then there are times and seasons of our lives where we experience sadness and joy. Verse 4, 
a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance. So we all experience times of sadness, of weeping, of mourning. You know, oh, my, my, my team lost the EPL and you cry. Oh, my loved one, not to make fun, you know, of that. People react in this way. And even in a more intense way, my loved one has died after a long illness of ups and downs. There was hope, then there was a loss of hope. You know, we also experience times of great laughter, of great dancing as well, you know, where your team won the EPL, you know, where uh, you got married and there was a big reception, there was dancing. So in life, we encounter all kinds of emotions. Sorrow and joy are part of life. And very often it is said we sorrow much because we loved much. So there are times when we are on the mountaintop, there are other times when we are in the valley below. Now, verse 5 tells us there are also times of intimacy and times of coldness. It reads, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. You know, this phrase is a bit uncertain when it comes to casting away and gathering stones, but a lot of Bible commentators say uh, this speaks about intimacy in marriage. And, you know, married couples, we all know this. Sometimes you feel close, you feel intimate, you feel loving. You know, other times you have no desire at all. You don't feel romantic. This is the same for hugging and not hugging, right? In life, you will have times of coldness, times of love. And for some, it is true that there will be no romance at all. This is something that we may never experience. But for others, they may have a spouse and no romance. So there's a time for everything. Verse 6 tells us that our life cycle will also include times of wealth, times of poverty. It says a time to get, a time to lose, a time to keep, a time to cast away. So there will be times in our life when we have plenty, when we get a lot, and then there's a time when we lose these things. You know, it's like your savings. You save up and with our meager uh, interest rates, the inflation is far more than that. Or when you finally save up and you can say, I can now take a holiday, then your fridge breaks down and you need to replace your fridge. You know, for those of you who do not experience this, what a wonderful thing. That is your lot. That is your time. Others have different times. Or when you finally have enough to pay up your mortgage, then you fall sick. Or you finally get a promotion, a pay rise. I have to pay more taxes now, and I'm in a different bracket, right? So there's a time for everything. And even your possessions, you buy clothes, what are you going to do with that size 25-inch waist thing that you can't fit into anymore? You got to get rid of it, right? So there are times, there are seasons. Verse 7, it speaks about times of sadness and times when we should stop being sad. A time to rend, a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak. You know, when people were mourning in the Old Testament, they would rend, they would tear their clothes, they would be silent. You know, like David, he put ash on his head, he fasted, he kept silent, you know, when his son was about to die. But after that, what happened? He got up and he mourned no more. He started eating again. He continued life as per normal. And this tells us that there is a time to mourn, to mourn loudly if needed. But there's also a time where we have to stop mourning. Verse 8, it speaks about relationships. <laughs> it says, a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. So there are times 
when things are good. You know, we're your friends with people. You know, we love one another. There's peace. You shake hands. Everything is great. You have dinner together. Then misunderstanding sets in. Maybe not just misunderstanding. You know, deliberate misunderstanding. Wanting to be easily outraged. You rub each other the wrong way. Then there will be times when we will hate we will have our wars. And so this is family life. This is work life. Every aspect of life we're dealing with people, you know, there will be hatred. There will be misunderstanding, wars and conflict. People will kill one another. You know, there are those amongst us here who were probably born in the 30s. You know, since then, we've seen many wars. World War II, you've seen the partition of India. You've seen, you know, the uh, Malayan emergency that we had. You see the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Suez Canal conflict, the Falklands. You know, maybe some of you would have remembered news that spoke about the Indonesian confrontasi. You know, all of these things you remember, you know, and recent years for some of you younger, you know, the Gulf War, Bosnia, Kosovo, Afghanistan, right, ISIS, Iraq, Syria, all of these wars. And just when there was peace, Bible speaks about times of peace. Now what happened after that? Taliban invaded Kabul again. All the weapons that were sent by the US are now theirs again. It's that weird cycle of life. I always think it's so interesting. You know, the, the United States supported the Mujahideen against the Russians, and the Mujahideen became the Taliban, the Taliban attack. You know, it's, it's, there's this whole cycle. It's frustrating. It's vanity of vanities, a vexation of spirit. So these are the times and seasons that God has appointed. Now, none of us here want a short life, but that's really not up to us because it's appointed by God we may die just like that our children may young people you may die tomorrow or you may live 120 years of pain or you may have 75 years 80 years 90 years of great health joy vigor great retirement that's what we want, but it doesn't always happen, right? And very often we wish our life was wonderful. We, we wish that we would retire and die in our sleep, but then disease sets in. You wish you would stay young and then you get your first white hair. You know, you wish you can have someone to spend the rest of your life with, but somehow that romance after 20 years is dead. You wish last year's clothes still fit you. And you're vaccinated. You could get infected. There's a time for COVID. There's a time for quarantine. So there are seasons. And these are life's realities, especially now. You know, Solomon is not making a value judgment. You know, he's not giving instruction like, e, you know, ah. Uh, there's a time when you must kill. There's a time when you must have peace. He's not giving instructions, right? He is saying simply that these are things that do happen. Whether you like them or not, they will happen to you. And this is a map of our lives. This is our photo albums. When we look through, this is what has happened in our lives. You know, in our lives, we will live, we will rejoice, we will dance, we will gain, we will lose loved ones, we will hate, we will mourn. There are times of great joy. There are times when we can't even put one foot after another. You can't get out of bed. You've got this deep knot in, the, in your heart, in the middle of your chest, and you just don't want to do anything. Every day is so hard. And so while we prefer to rejoice rather than mourn, it's not up to us. We are those who experience these things. We're not the ones who determine these things. These things are determined by God, and there is a time to every purpose under heaven. But what is that purpose? 
Why does God give these things to us? Why? And the reason, the reason for this is because God is inflicting us with these times and seasons for a purpose. He is burdening us with this. That's the second point. Solomon asks in verse 9, what's the point in all of these? What's the profit in this? What was the point of your life? You know, birth, death, plant, pluck, kill, heal, break, build, weep, laugh, mourn, dance. And the first thing that hits us is very unsettling. Verse 10 and 11 tells us that it is God who is the one who gives these things for us to trouble us. I've seen the travail which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised, to be troubled by it. He hath made everything beautiful in his time. So God is the one that gives it as a burden. He has appointed an appropriate time. So the word he makes all things beautiful in his time is not to be interpreted, oh, you're very sad now, huh? But God will change everything and he will make all things beautiful in his time. <laughs> That's not the meaning there. The meaning is there is a beautiful, appropriate time for everything. There is an appropriate time. It's suitable. All of these things in our lives, the ups and our downs, they are appointed by God because He knows they are suitable for us. The money that we have, the loss of money we experience, the health that we have, the lack of health that we may have, all of these things are suitable. The initial happiness in marriage, the present difficulties, these things are appropriate that God deems for your life now. That great job that you may have, but the threat of redundancy. It's all by God because he believes it is suitable. To him, to him, they are beautiful. And we all have different lots in life. And he does this for a purpose. Now, why? Why does God give us this frustration? Why does he give us this lot in life to deal with, it is so that we can be humbled, so that we would ask, why? All right? And verse 11, it is intentional on God's part that we would question. In verse 11, it says, also he hath set the world, or in some other versions, he has set, he has placed the world, he has placed eternity into our hearts, so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. So he has set this infinite, this vacuum, as it were, or this uh, big question in our hearts so that we would ask, why do these things happen? What is the purpose? Why is it that I have sickness after sickness? Why is it that my life was all fine until this tragedy happened? You know, why did God give me these good things? Is it so that he... He would set me up for these bad things later on? Why is it that I have a spouse that I have lost far too early? Why do I have a spouse that will not just go? What purpose is it for? So that we can see how small we are, to know how ignorant we are. It says in verse 11, so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. And when we do not understand, when we are confronted with these burdens in our life, then we will fear God. We will reverence him. In verse 14, I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it. Nothing can be taken from it. God doeth it that men should fear before him. He did these things so that we would submit to his sovereign plan, so that we would be dependent on him. You know, a phrase I kept using last week was sometimes we, as people, we want things our way. We bang our heads against the wall just to make a hole so that we can go through to get what we want. And all trouble follows after. But here, God does these things so that we may fear him, 
Not that we would knock our heads against the wall, so that we would depend on him, that we would realize that we are creatures, that he alone is creator. So in other words, God intends for us to be humbled through these things. You know, Job lost everything, didn't he? He lost his farm, he lost his family, his flesh was afflicted, you know, the female wife of his gave him trouble in his life, and his friends ended up being his foes. He asked God, why? Why? What have I done? They're telling me that I'm a sinner, that I deserve this, but I have not done anything. God, you come down, you tell me what happened. Why are things like this? Why, why, why? The entire 30 over chapters, he asked this, and in the end, when God came down and said, by the way, Job, where were you when I created this, when I created that? Do you know the ends of the earth from the ends of the earth? Do you know how deep the earth is? God never answered Job's question, why? But in the end, Job said, I understand. By the seeing of my eye, I understand that I am nothing and I worship you. He never got the answers. Ever got the answers. Never, ever got the answers. But he surrendered himself to the will of God to the word of God. He humbled himself. And that's what happens when we come to this realization. The answer to our problems is a sovereign and a good God, and that answer is enough. When we know that God is great and we are small, his purposes are infinite, and that we can't understand all of it, that's when we reverence God, even in the dreadfulness of life, even in burdensome times, we find joy. And that's the last point. Verse 12 and 13, I know that there is no good in them, but for a man to rejoice and to do good in his life, and also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of his labor. It is the gift of God. Now, one of the great responses to this frustrating life, to this helplessness that we have, is to make the most of it. Even though we may not understand why things happen to us, God has called us to enjoy life, to do good in the time that he has given to us. You know, it says, I know that nothing is better for them than to rejoice and to do good in their lives. This is the response of believers. And this is our application. This is our application. You know, dearly beloved, as we go through the book of Ecclesiastes, you'll find that the applications are often quite similar because that was Solomon's purpose. So the application here is life is messy. We enjoy life. That is the tension. We live in that tension. We must accept. We must know that God's the one who determines the times and seasons. Some things, yes, we can be proactive about. We can do. We can open the door that's been presented to us. But other times, we cannot do anything to change anything at all. The Lord giveth. The Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And so in the midst of trouble, there can be and there should be praise. In the midst of sickness, as you're lying there with tubes out of your arm, tubes out of your nose, you know, tubes and wires sticking out of everywhere, you can marvel that you have a world-class medical treatment in Singapore. You can rejoice in the fact that God has given you doctors and nurses who are there to take care of you, even that crabby little missy who walks around scolding everyone, you can give thanks to her, to God for her. And even though you may be on the way home and you're stuck in our world-class MRT system which has broken down, there's no place to sit, you can still enjoy your podcast through your Bluetooth AirPods. It's not moving. You can catch up on your reading. You know, you may have many days of laundry to do. You may spend time sorting through the whites and the colored and the darks. You have that white shirt with that stain on it. You bleach that stain and it's almost gone, but in some light you can see a dark gray stain on it. But 
After you do all of your laundry, you fold everything, you iron everything, you put everything there, you can marvel and be satisfied that, wow, the laundry's done, and that shirt with that gray stain does not bother you anymore. You are in church. You have been offended. You forgive. You seek forgiveness. You forbear. You learn to love. And though those past offenses may still be there with you, and you try and forget them, you can still press on. You can enjoy those times of renewed but tenuous friendships. This can happen. But the opposite, the opposite is also true. You're well. You must realize that one day you may fall sick. You visit people in the hospital. One day you may be there. You're happy, kids, without a care. But you will have many cares one day. And so in the midst of this, we ought to be sober, to learn to enjoy what we have, because there's nothing better than to enjoy your labor, because life is unpredictable. Our times and seasons are unpredictable. God has given us this gift. And also, it says that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the gift of God. You know, this is how our life will be from now until heaven. Some of you have great dreams. You know, I'm going to get married, have 2.5 kids, have a car, earn enough, retire, do this, do that. Oh, you know, I'm going to be carefree for the rest of my life. I'm going to grow old with all my friends, you know, move into a nursing home together or have a homestay and get, you know, uh, you know, people to, you know, help us to come and take care of us. You have this plan in your life. There's no perfection. Your life from now until heaven will be full of frustration. And what is given to you is to eat, to drink, to rejoice in what God has given. There will be a cycle of ups and downs. There's no formula to this. Some of us have not learned that yet. You know, we're like process engineers. If I put A in, then I should get B. If I send my child to this school, he should go to Oxford in Cambridge with a you know, president scholarship next time. <laughs> we have not learned this. We're, life is not about process engineering. God is the one who has set the times and the seasons, and we're going to ask why. The simple answer is, why? God has ordained it. It is beautiful in his sight. You won't understand everything. And in the midst of this messiness, make the best of your life because it is the gift of God. You have no control over birth, death, seasons, and times. It's not your responsibility to determine them. These are secret things that we do not know but in all of this, are we not glad that we have a good God? Yes, all of these things happen, but he is a good God. He, of all people, has come to save us. Even though life is dizzy and weary, if we did not question, we would not come to this loving God. If everything went our way, we would not look to him for life beyond the sun. God is sovereign. And this is what our confession tells us in Article 13. As his actions surpass human understanding, let us not curiously inquire further than our capacity allows. But with great humility and reverence, we adore the just judgments of God, which are hidden from us. We content ourselves as pupils of Christ who have only to learn those things which he teaches us in his word without transgressing these limits. And so when we think of how God is sovereign, how messy our life is, this doctrine of God's sovereignty comforts us. Nothing happens by chance, even though Hard things, terrible things may happen. God still loves you. He watches over you with a fatherly care. And because of that fatherly care, 
It was because of that fatherly care, despite all of our appropriate times and seasons in life, in all of the world, that at the fullness of time, that at the appropriate time, God sent his son, made of a woman, to live under the law and to redeem us. It was a suitable, perfect time for Christ to live, to heal, to be broken, to have friends, to be betrayed by them, to weep, to die, to shout on the cross, to resurrect, to rejoice and to be taken up to heaven where he sits on the right hand of God the Father and he has a people over which he rules and loves and takes care of, a people whom he desires to take back to heaven One day where there's ultimate joy, our times and seasons are not our own, my brothers and sisters. Rejoice in the Lord Jesus. If there's any certainty in all of this messiness in life, it is this, that I am not my own, but belong to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He also preserves me in such a way that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from our heads. And he makes us willing to live for him. Let us surrender ourselves to this loving Savior who gives us these times and seasons that we may live for him. Let us pray. Father, we look forward to a time where there will be neither tears, nor pain, nor sin, nor sorrow. But until then, help us to enjoy what you have given. Every day, living surrendered lives, expecting your best, because you are the one who has ordained them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.